Well, hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Root River Community Church. Great to see you guys on this 4th of July weekend. Awesome to be in God's house with you guys. Uh, if this is your first time to Root River Community Church, let me tell you, it's not a perfect church, but it is a it is a good one. We're so glad that you're along for the ride this morning. People tuning in online, love you guys so much. Wish you could be here with us. Want to turn everybody's attention to a little card in the back of a chair near you. That's what we call the Connect card, and that's just a simple and easy way for you to get further connected to the life and ministry of Root River Community Church. We always say that's great to come to a Sunday morning experience, but if you really want to grow in your faith, you got to make sure that you get connected, that you have three good, say it with me, three good Christian friends and get plugged into a ministry team. You can get connected today by filling out that card, dropping it off at our Connect table out in our lobby, and somebody midweek would be happy to follow up with you. A couple of uh, little things that we want to announce here this morning. There's been a New Testament Bible study happening at Peter and Polly's house over there, a jump skip away in the, the beautiful town of Canton, Minnesota. It's a great Bible study. From what I've been hearing, there's tons of people who've been turning out to it. I'm actually planning on going this week, so you guys can uh, come along with me this Friday at 7 p.m. Want to make a note of that. Also want to make a note that there's a Bible Adventure Family Night coming up. This is kind of a VBS-style event, Wednesday, July 13th at 6 p.m. Make sure that you sign up your kids at the Connect table here this morning. Also want to highlight the annual Operation Christmas Child shoebox run. This is to raise some money for the shipping that comes with sending shoeboxes all over the world. We, we take part of that ministry. You can sign up today to run in the race. It begins 8 a.m. on July 16th during Rushford Days. Uh, so there's more information out in the foyer for you. With all that being said, uh, so glad you guys are with us here this morning. I want to invite up one of my best friends, Jackson King, to the stage. Jackson's giving the message. Come on, we all love Jackson. Jackson, I just scribbled down a couple things I wanted to say. Uh, I remember uh, seven years ago driving down um, the road to my house, and every time the Spirit of God would whisper, you got to meet this guy. Jackson and I, we live right next to each other, and he'd be out in his yard working, doing something really manly, something like that. <laughs> and I just felt like this Holy Spirit said, you got to meet this guy. You got to meet this guy. Uh, we met at Jesse Street Java Coffee Shop, and I asked him all those awkward questions that Pastor Mike asked people, like, do you have any spiritual beliefs? <laughs> and where would you go if you died? And all that kind of stuff. And uh, through a process, Jackson very quickly gave his life to Jesus Christ. And let me tell you what, this is the real deal right up here. This is a man of God who loves his family, loves the Lord, loves the Word of God, loves the local church. He's served here as a deacon for the last six years. Jackson, I want to say, I really believe you have the gift of discernment for the body of Christ. Mix in there a little bit of the gift of faith. And uh, I just love you so much, brother. I'm so thankful. So uh, I say this. Uh, before every guest speaker, it's sometimes nerve-wracking to be up here. I want to encourage us to encourage Jackson. Let's give him lots of hallelujahs. Preach it, preacher. That's good. Come on. Preach it, brother. All those kind of things to cheer him on. Would you guys help him and welcome and honor my good, dearest friend, Jackson <laughs> King, this morning. Well, good morning, everybody. I get an amen, I guess. Well, I see that I can skip page four because Pastor Mike basically gave all the good details away. <laughs> you know, what I'm going to talk about today is that God has a plan. And the way that I can tell that for sure is that the verse that Cole Doblar used is on page one of my message. If that's not a plan, I don't know what is. Now, before we get to that, there's a couple things. These are building plans. I'll worry about them later. And if I listened to the world, I wouldn't be here right now. So that's a, we'll just ruminate on that for a little bit. But first, I don't know, have you guys noticed it's the 4th of July? Weekend, it's getting close. You know, I was trying to find some jokes. I know we're not supposed to talk about jokes, but you know, we talk about jokes. I could not find any, like there's no knock-knock jokes about America. 
Yeah, it's because freedom rings. <laughs> right? Freedom rings, yep. Now, another good, uh, you know, holiday or like holiday, 4th of July thing to do is barbecue grilling. You know, everybody just loves to throw some meat on the grill, watch and you know, make sure the grease fires don't get too high. You know, I used to be obsessed with grilling raw meat, but now I'm cured. <laughs> yep, mm-hmm. Yep, mm -hmm. yep. And many of you know this, maybe some of you don't. I actually work for Eagle Ridge Construction. Am Ammon's here, Manny's here, both bosses, awesome guys. They're now both looking for a way to leave very quickly because I mentioned them. Um, but since I work construction, I end up coming in contact with a lot of people from the other trades. And I've, you know, you have conversations with people, and I've really come to realize that there's kind of a common theme with them. A lot of times, electricians always seem kind of shocked when you talk to them. <laughs> and then I always feel sorry for the plumbers. And Kyle, you might recognize this. They always just seem so drained. <laughs> so there you go. Three jokes. <laughs> Anyway, what I want to start with today is that God has a plan, and he had the plan established from before the beginning. So, Cole, we will be in Genesis chapter 1, scooting over to chapter 2, maybe 5 for a bit of it. Anyway, it works. That's a good thing, isn't it? So I declare from the beginning how it will end and foretell from the start what has not yet happened. I decree that my purpose will stand and I will fulfill my every plan. Isaiah, it, it's a longer book in the Old Testament, but it has got some good stuff in it. Like that meat from the Bible, you know, what you're looking for. It's really good stuff. And that just declares right there that God's had a plan from the beginning. And he had it on day one. He created light. There we go. Light. Day one. Day two, atmosphere in the firmament, which if you're not really sure what the firmament is, I kind of had to look it up. It's pretty much the matter around us. It's the stuff that is, the earth, you know, things that are. And then day three, the dry ground of the plants. Day four, the sun, moon, and stars. Day five, birds and sea creatures. And if you start to look at days three, four, and five, you'll say, that's kind of an interesting order. Why are things that way? That seems not right but it's very right, and it proves that there's a plan. Day six, or, yeah, so day five, birds and sea creatures. Day six, land animals and humans. And day seven, the Sabbath of rest, which is a very important thing. And that's something that for me growing up was not emphasized at all. In my family, Sunday was just another day for work. There was no point to celebrate anything. It was just work and work and work. And that really starts to drag on somebody. And you, it just is not a natural thing. This is the natural thing right here. This is what we're supposed to be doing. It's the way it was created to be. So if we look at, you know, the order of things, I'm just going to go back to that, is that if the days were not in this order, could life itself even survive? You know, if you look at the order things were created, day three you have dry ground and plants. And, but day four, you have the sun, the moon, and the stars. If you look and say, well, sure, there's light on day one. That's no big deal. The plants have plenty of light. But you have to realize plants need sunlight. They also need a dark time for them to survive. If they were in constant light all the time, the growing cycle is messed up. And we, of course, have to realize as these were created, that's how we see them today. It's not that they somehow changed it's that they were created the way that we see them. There is a persistence of the way things are, created from a plan. You know, and also you see flowering plants. They need birds and bees to help with pollination right away, immediately. They are not able to survive more than one generation unless things were created close together. But then we look and say, day six, land animals and humans, why, why are humans last? Why not first? Well, it says in the Bible that we are called to be the caretakers, the good stewards of what God has created. Now, I'm going to make some analogies later on. And guys, you know me. I like analogies and little stories. But we'll get to that in a bit. Slight teaser. <laughs> that in order for the creation to have its best chance, 
God knew that he needed us to be there with it. That it all works together. And I'm going to talk about the city of harmony in a bit, but harmony, we'll go with that. So how does this work and fit into my job of construction? Well, you have to realize, how do you build a house? Do you start with a roof? Because in a lot of ways, with us being the good stewards and the protector of God's creation, we are the roof. But if you build the roof first, it's not going to last long. It's just going to be shingles and some boards laying on the ground. You can't really build it that way. You have to start at the base. You have to start with a firm foundation built on a rock. God calls it out all through the Bible exactly how we're supposed to be. And then after the foundation, you build your first floor, some walls, maybe a second floor if you're feeling kind of sassy. And then, then a roof on the top, and the roof protects it. It aids in protection, it looks after things, it makes sure that what's underneath it does not rot and decay. So God has the plan, and we are created with a purpose to be the roof. But how does the devil attack that? Now there's this great guy that I know. He probably figured out what I'm going to talk about. What, what does the devil attack, Jim? The foundation. <laughs> he will attack the foundation. He will attack maybe how long it took for creation to be. Was it days? Like days that we know? Because it says in creation that it has the sun, the moon, and the stars. And then it goes on to say after that, that that's what sets in place the time. The days, months, years, centuries, all that in place is what is, as we know and perceive as time. But the devil will say, oh, it could take millions, billions of years. But when you look at the order that things were created, you can see that that just couldn't be. We cannot survive without the other pieces. The puzzle fits together perfectly, and without it, we don't exist. But how does the devil attack? Well, he tries to attack the foundation by going after how long does it take. Because if you can attack Genesis chapter 1, 2, 5, all those beginning ones, you can attack everything else. You know, a house that is well built, it can weather a storm. Hail can damage the roof. But the devil can say, what is a man or what is a woman? If you're wondering more about that, you can look at Pastor Mike's message from last week. It was very good. You know, the house will be damaged, but it survives, and it can be fixed. The wind can blow out the windows. Maybe they talk about abortion and say, that's okay. The house is damaged, but it can be fixed. But if an earthquake shatters the foundation, how can the house stand? It won't. It'll crumble. And how can that house be rebuilt? And there's only one answer, and the entire Bible points toward it from the very beginning. The answer is Jesus. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so let's build a biblical house with a plan. We're going to call it the house of salvation. If we look in Genesis 5, there is the plan. It's called right out. The names of the first 10 men in the Bible, and we all know Hebrew names and our names today all have meaning, they mean something special. And as you go through and read the Bible, you might not realize what happens when you start to put them together, that they create an entire phrase that calls out the entire purpose of it, of it all. Adam means man, Seth is appointed, Enosh means mortal, Kenan is sorrow, Mahalalel, the blessed God, Jared shall come down, Enoch, teaching, Methuselah, his death shall bring, Lamech, the despairing, and Noah, rest or comfort. Now, I'm going to take a little bit of a break. I'm going to take a little break and just say, that got me thinking, what does my name mean? What about my family's names, my, my ancestors, my grandpa, my great-grandpa? So my name is Jackson. Funny, it means the son of Jack. That's kind of easy to figure out. <laughs> but let's go a little further. Let's just go with Jack. What does it mean? God is gracious. Well, if... So my grandpa's name was Joel Jackson. 
So he, his name, Joel, means Jehovah is his God. So my grandpa's name was literally Jehovah is his God and God is gracious. That's pretty cool. If you go back to his grandpa, his name was Eben Titus. I got some good ones back there. Uh-oh. I don't need those anymore anyway. They can stay down there. So Eben is a short form of Ebenezer, which means stone of help. And Titus means title of honor. So that's a pretty cool name to say, Eben Titus King. It's pretty neat. So our names carry a lot of weight. I would encourage you to all just Google your name. Say, what does my name mean? And your relatives' names. I bet there's some pretty neat stuff out there. It all seems like it might have had a plan behind it. Anyway, back to these guys. You know, when you read the names in the Bible, they say this person's name meant this, and this person's name meant that. It's never in a list. You never see it together. So it just kind of says, yeah, Methuselah means his name shall bring down. What was his mother thinking? You know, it's, it always seems to be just separated. But when you put it together and you add a few extra little, little words to make it flow a little better, you can come up with a sentence. It says, man has been appointed but suffers with mortal sorrow. The blessed God shall come down with his teaching and his death shall bring the despairing man rest and comfort. Well, if that's not the sign of a plan, I don't know what is. When I first heard this, and I didn't discover this on my own, I, I heard it as on a, a, a uh, pastor's message on YouTube, and that was like, rewind, what was that? Rewind, what was that again? It was, blew my mind that those names in that order actually created the entire message of the gospel. It's all there. But where have we heard this before? Because really, this sentence, I could just say, Instead of saying man has been appointed, I could say Adam, Seth, Enosh, Canaan, Mahalalel, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, Noah. Period. Moving on. I like the other version better, personally, but it reads easier. But where have we heard this before? Well, we hear it in Romans in 6.23. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ, our Lord. Well, that sounds the same. It's right there. It's repeated over and over. That plan that God has put in place from the very beginning just reverberates through the entire Old Testament, New Testament. It reverberates through our lives. It is an amazing thing. I'm just going to put these down here. Right on. We're moving on. Anyway, so what is God's plan for me? How did I get here? You know, I didn't grow up going to church. My parents, who I love very much, I would say now I feel they're very misguided in what they believe. We are 180 degrees apart on a lot of things. And I really, I pray that the Lord will find some way for it to just for us to come together and actually have a good conversation. That time has not happened. I also did not tell them that I was preaching today. I'm waiting until after, until I feel, see how I feel and pray about it, do I send them the YouTube link and say, check this out. Maybe that's how the conversation starts. I don't know. I never really read the Bible until I was in my mid-20s. You know, growing up, it was just work seven days a week. I basically went to high school because I felt like that was a vacation instead of working. But you know, that's kind of funny. I was an only child. My dad had a brother who had one daughter. I was the only hope for my King family name to carry on. So I went from being an only child to the father of five. Two awesome boys and three wonderful girls. The one thing that the world tried to sell me that would go against God's plan was the theory of evolution. And I don't know what it was about it that in, I remember in high school, not having any background really in church and in the Bible, I remember listening to the theory about, oh, the finches from the Galapagos Islands, they evolved to change their beaks, and they're different. And I was thinking, you just said they're still finches. All it means is that God allowed them to change a beak to eat something different. If you live in a cold area, you know, animals grow more hair. If they live in the desert, they have less hair. You know, a matter of survival being created to be resilient and the ability to adapt where you live, that is not a changing of kinds. They're still finches. And that, I think that point right there was probably the beginning of the end of worldliness for me because it was that 
it was that God attacked the foundation of the world. And it just turned it all around for me. And I started to think, well, if that's right, what else is right? So that's one of the places where I think a lot of people get tricked. And I remember a lot of my friends were like, oh, yeah, this and that. And they did this, and they changed their kinds. And the primordial goo became a you know, chimpanzee. I'm like, well, it doesn't seem like this works. I fix stuff. It never gets smarter when I fix it. <laughs> it usually doesn't work as well, so whatever. Now, enough about that. There's a lot of foundational stuff in there. There is a pun in there, and I intended to use it. But moving on is life. How did I get here? Well, I met my lovely wife, Kimberly Grace, at UW River Falls, where we went to college together. She had declared when she went to college, she said to her dad, no farmer, no flannel, no beards. <laughs> that was her plan. <laughs> God has a plan. And he said, oh, no, you don't. So we went through college. Uh, my wife was doing elementary education. So she got a job in the cities because that's where like all new teachers get a job because turnover is high because it's a really hard place to work. Teachers, I really appreciate all that you do. It is an amazing job. It's a selfless job, honestly. Uh, but after that, I had a job up there. I found one to work. And we ended up, after we had our son Hayden, who was our oldest, and then our daughter Hallie was just born, we realized that we were being called to not be there anymore. And we f I felt drawn to move to Rushford when I mentioned it to my wife, because she grew up here, she cried. <laughs> but the Lord worked on her heart, and she had a vision of like peace, mo like motherhood, like just peacefully rocking a child in a rocking chair. And you know, just a simple, easier life. We now live in the house that my wife grew up in. We bought it from her parents. So it's pretty fun. I know the guy that lived there for 30 years before that. There's no secrets to that house. <laughs> anyway, so how did God let me make my choices? And I say choices because really there's a plan, and we're allowed choices that still guide us where God wants us to go. In high school, I made the relatively nerdy decision to do computer-aided design which means you draw things on a computer and have no social life. It's kind of tough. I did it for a long time. I also chose to do that for two hours a day for two years in high school, which is a pretty good jump start on the nerd factory. <laughs> After that, I went to River Falls, Wisconsin to college for engineering. We're making great choices here. <laughs> and then after that, I went to a tech school to learn how to do welding and more design stuff. Even though I didn't really realize that God was guiding me down these paths, because really no one chooses this unless it's I don't know, the Lord. <laughs> I've been there so I can make these jokes. So I mentioned my wife found a teaching job in the cities. So I decided I should find a job engineering welding wise around the Twin Cities. So I went on the Star Tribune one day during a college class, and I found this company called the Minnesota Wanner Company. Didn't know anything about it. So I called them. They were looking for someone like me, but the secretary had no idea that an ad had been placed. It was right there, easy to find on the Star Tribune website, but no one had ever really seemed to place it. Even the boss didn't really realize it. So there's the Lord, guiding with the plan again. There I became an applications engineer, which oddly enough, seems to be perfect for me because I like to apply everything to everything else. If I can stand up here on a Sunday morning and talk about carburetors, big block engines, and the gospel, there is an application right there. <laughs> I was able to design and build stuff, learning how the process from beginning to end would work. And then we moved to Rushford. I continued to do work for them you know, remotely. And I, I was actually approached by Jake Tim, the principal of the high school, in this church about becoming a shop teacher in Rushford. And I thought, if it happened in church, I should do it. So I did. <laughs> what did I learn there? I learned one thing. I learned how to be in front of 18-year-olds who have no interest in what you're talking about. <laughs> it's an elective. They chose to be there, but they don't see it that way. 
But, but works with that is that now when you consider that I work for Eagle Ridge Construction, they've hired several previous students of mine. Not only did I learn how to interact with 18-year-olds and build relationships, which is something an only child really isn't great at, but I now have coworkers who were my students. And a lot of the young people here are my past students, and it's really nice to be able to talk to them. So it's, it's, it's a pretty cool thing. Now, this might come to shock you, but my current job of construction, I met my bosses at church here. I don't even try to hide from the plan anymore. I'm just like, all right, Lord, what's the plan? Just send it down here. We got it. Now I get to use those CAD skills I used before to design houses. I then get to go sometimes build the houses. The Lord has put this plan in place in my life that leads me to having the tools and the knowledge to do a job. And what do I get to do now? Now we're designing to build a church in harmony. Some of you might have figured out what's on the screen. Now, this is where I get to the point of where Mike already said the backstory. I met him in a coffee shop. He literally did drive past my house and see me mowing my lawn and pray for me. My wife prayed that I would meet some good Christian friends. I got way more than three. That's a pretty good blessing right there. And also, to even add on to that... Mike and I, our friendship is the third generation of my family where a pastor was a close friend. But I listened to the plan. Why? You know, why did I listen to it? I don't know what it is. Third time's a charm? That sounds like luck, and that doesn't really work here. But I think what happened is that for some reason, maybe it was that foundational moment in high school when I said, evolution doesn't make sense. There's a crack in that foundation of what the world wants to sell to me. And I said that they, from that point, I think the trajectory of my family was changed for every generation. A generational curse of grumpiness, depression, unhappiness, gone. I'm so much happier now than I was 15 years ago. It's not even comparable. Just a blessing from the Lord. So how do we recognize God's plan? You know, I've got a set of house plans here. I've been using them for the last couple months. They're kind of worn and covered in coffee spills and pencil writings and whatever. It's a notepad, honestly. You know, these are plans that were created by man to build a house. But there's errors in this plan. Just like with everything that man does, there is an error. In this plan, if you walked from the laundry room into the garage, You'd hit the ceiling height in the garage about here. That's not good. I'm not even tall, and that's a bad idea. So we had to make some changes to the plan. But you know, that's the beauty of God's plan. It's because God's plan is perfect. And Josh, you can mosey whenever you want. That God's plans are spotless, and they're perfect. They never get dirty, and you never have to make revisions. If any of you have built a house or planned anything, you know stuff changes all the time. But with the Lord's plan from the very beginning, it was perfect. Stay. <laughs> but we have to be ready. You know, because Satan's going to try to come in and say something like, oh, God only's got the cover page. There's nothing. It's just one piece of paper. You can make it whatever you want. I'm here to tell you that from life experience, and I know this to be 100% true, there is more than one page in God's plan for all of you. There is hundreds and thousands of pages that add depth and complexity and happiness and enjoyment and a sense of fulfill fulfillment that unless you have God's plan, you will never know it. And that is an amazing thing that he's given us the ability to even experience that and have that opportunity in our lives. You know, but Satan will try. He'll be like, you know, it's just one page. Make it up as you go. You know, maybe he'll throw some rainstorms and some blistering sun. Throw your schedule off. Hail, wind, you know, maybe grumpy neighbors. Someone you're talking with, they just don't seem happy anytime. Maybe that's God. But Satan's going to try to throw you off course, but God's going to say, there's a chance to talk. Get to know him, you know. How's it going? 
So if we were to finish this phrase, imagine if we followed God's plan, what would that look like? That's a powerful thing right there. Because if we listen to God's plan, and it's not always a very loud plan. A lot of times it's the whisper. It's not roaring, it's quiet. And on that day of rest, on the Sabbath day, there's a good chance just to sit, reflect, forget where your phone is. Lose the remote to the TV. You know, I'm not saying drop kick the monitor or the computer out the window. Maybe that's what it takes. I don't know. But that is a great time to just sit and say, Lord, what are the plans? Let me know. So let's pray. Lord, I know I usually throw in Ezekiel 36, 26. So I'm going to do it right here. Am and smiling right now, I can tell. You know, help us to get rid of that heart of stone, replace it with a heart of flesh, and to soften our hearts so that we are able to better recognize what the plans are for you. Help us to push aside what the devil's trying to say to us, and we just know that there's peace and comfort and that you've had it in your hands from the very beginning. Amen. Thank you, Jackson. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Jackson didn't have to come up here today. He could have said no. Every one of us is asked to serve the Lord. Not everybody's asked to do a sermon. Not everybody's asked to be up front. But... We are all asked to serve in some capacity the Lord. Moses was asked back in the day, he had a big task, lead Israel out. There was a, there was a thumb on Israel, and it was Egypt. And a pharaoh, one of the most powerful nations, one of the most powerful people on earth. But Moses said yes. Tomorrow we celebrate the 4th of July. It's a very similar thing happened, and it's, it's often talked about in history. There were six, or there were 13 colonies, small, that had, that they were under the thumb of a brutal regime. The most powerful nation in the world, England, at the time. 13 colonies, it didn't look good. It was the strongest navy in the, in the world. But they, they said no. They signed the Declaration of Independence. And they said no more of this. Every single one of us could say no, and we often do when we're supposed to serve God. Moses could have said no. The 13 colonies could have said no because it's easier. Jackson could have said no, but he didn't. We all need to serve, so say yes. Would you please rise? Lord, we just thank you for this body. We thank you for, for people like Jackson and, and many others that have stepped up, Lord to proclaim your word here. And we ask for your presence to be with us. And we, we pray that we will remember all the sacrifices. As we celebrate tomorrow, our Independence Day, we help us to remember the sacrifices in all those before us that said yes. Pray you bless everyone going home today and bless this nation. In Jesus' name, amen. We have prayer in the front and fellowship in the back. Thank you all for coming.